The UC Davis Medal recognizes and celebrates the recipient's extraordinary contributions that embody our vision of excellence. In the past, great UC Davis artists, such as poet Gary Snyder and painter Wayne Thibault, have received the medal. Medals have also gone to the extraordinary philanthropists Robert and Margaret Mandavi and Barbara Jackson. Our own UC Davis astronaut Steve Robinson was a medal recipient as well, and also Charlie Sutterquist, a legendary businessman, philanthropist, conservationist, an author who built so many bridges between our campus and the business sector. In 2002, the medal was even awarded to former President Bill Clinton. Today, we honor Delane Easton. And honoring Delane carries on this rich tradition. Delane's groundbreaking career has been dedicated to education and public service and she has been a staunch and fierce advocate for higher public education in ways that will benefit California students for years to come. She has led efforts to raise educational standards, increase access to technology, make gardens part of our classroom, and much, much more. As the first in her family to attend college, we could not be more proud that Delane chose UC Davis for her undergraduate studies. During four terms in the State Assembly, and as the first woman to serve as California's State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Delane always put students first and continues to do so in her many activities since formally leaving state service. Delane's career and accomplishments represent the very best of UC Davis, our ideals, our values, and our commitment to research, scholarship, and service. And she is a shining example for all of us of how a motivated person powered by a world-class education can make a real difference in the world. Please join me in congratulating Delaine Easton as this year's recipient of the UC Davis Medal. Wow. Well, first, I want to expect, express my deep appreciation to Chancellor Kate, who has been an inspired and inspiring leader of my alma mater. I must also express my thanks to Ralph Hexter for the nomination to receive this medal, and to Dean Mangan and the other members of our stage party. Thank you for allowing me to join you. When I went through graduation here in June of 1969, I confess I never could have imagined I would ever join this stage party. So if you see me pinching myself, you'll understand why. I was privileged to speak at Letters and Science commencement in 1992, and I am amazed all over again tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, and most especially graduates, tonight is a night most of you will remember for your whole lives. For this is commencement. This is the beginning of a new chapter, and it is special and important. You know, since 1849, California has been thought of as a place where people dared to dream and do. So tonight, I hope to dare the UC Davis College of Letters and Science class of 2015 to dream and do. And not just for each other, and not just for your younger siblings and your children, but for all children, whether they were born here or born elsewhere. I salute you because I realize now more than ever how much our children need heroes and that Hollywood and the movies give us a false impression of what heroes look like. Real heroes look more like Mr. Rogers than Bradley Cooper. More like Betty White or Barbara Jordan than Reese Witherspoon. Heroes look like Abe Lincoln and Harriet Tubman, Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Chu, and Alice Waters. They look like the individuals in this graduating class.
When I was approached to give this commencement, and it was one of the most extraordinary moments of my life, I thought this is an important place to reflect on what we as educators must do. We must help our leaders to put children and their education first again. This is not just a matter of balancing the books. This is a matter of national security, economic prosperity, a healthy environment, a civil society, and a positive future. This is about reinventing optimism in California. And we need heroes right now, as too many people are becoming faint-hearted about big ideas. We need big ideas developed by those who conduct research to create solutions to problems in many disciplines and across disciplines. And the heroes who create the big ideas and the solutions to huge problems will look like this class of graduates. But please remember that while great research institutions like our wonderful UC Davis will do this great research, we also need leaders with the courage and the vision and the heart to follow the direction the research points us to. Let me give you an example. We know the underlying themes for building systems for protecting our vulnerable children. It's been laid out by research. Dr. Barney Bernard points out we need the protective factors of caring relationships, high expectations, and opportunities to participate and contribute. Second, we need to remember that our studies tell us that programs per se are not the answer. We need people to act as mentors. As Bernard notes, no program design can compensate for a mentor that is not caring, respectful, and reciprocal. Third, and most importantly, quote, resilience research confirms unequivocally the power of one person to make a difference. But Dr. Bernard goes on to say, while the power of one is real, it is not always enough. Furthermore, the power of more than one, of two or several or many, is much more than additive, it is exponential. We must work together to weave a fabric of resilience that connects not just young people to their families, schools, and communities, but one that connects families, schools, and communities. And we need schools and communities to connect to each other. Remember, all students are looking for a why, and we hold the key. But despite what research tells us about education, the important role that it plays in transforming educational opportunities for our poorest children, there are many in Sacramento who have dramatically reduced investment in education generally and the scaffolding and support of our poorest children specifically. For the record, I spent many years in Union City, a wonderful majority-minority community of some 30,000-plus citizens in the 1980s. Now it has over 70,000. We had over 50 gangs in Union City in the 1980s before it was fashionable. Our children were looking for connections, for links, for protection, and for support. So we coalesced the city and the schools and our community groups with our families to support those children. We focused on attendance and enlisted the police department to help us keep kids in school and reduce truancy. Guess what happened? Well, attendance went up dramatically and the school district got a lot of more money increased revenue from the state because children were in school. Graduation rates went up. Oh, college applications shot up so much that within five years, James Logan High School was a top 10 high school for affirmative action admissions to the University of California at Berkeley in this state. You know what else happened, teen pregnancy dropped. Oh, and the daytime crime rate in Union City, it only dropped 33%. Research tells us education is important, but so does common sense. Education is the best anti-poverty program the world has ever known. Archimedes in ancient Greece was asked, when he explained his new invention, the lever, he was asked, just how powerful is this tool? Archimedes thought for a minute and said, let me tell you how powerful it is. 
you give me a place to stand and a lever and a fulcrum and I will move the world. I believe that education is our lever, and I hope you do too. I think the levers of, levels of government closest to the people are the most real, and if we tell people the truth, they will respond with creative solutions to mitigate the cuts to our schools. But we must not only rebuild education, we must connect all local agencies around the issues of child well-being. That's what the research tells us. You know, in great civilization, schools are an institutional incubator of human potential. We must ensure that our schools are the repository of past success and the laboratory for future adventures in our time. Now, for the future greatness of not only our country, but each individual student, we must make our schools a living, breathing place for the engagement of our students. We must say to every student, we need you. There are talents in you we do not know yet about. Maybe you know what your talents are, maybe you don't yet. That's okay. We'll help you identify them. We will help you light a passion for them. We will help you develop them and put them to use. So let us speak about the physical, social, and emotional health in, of our children as well as their educational achievement because they all go together. I think it is appropriate, therefore, we invest some time looking back on how we got here as well as looking forward to the new frontiers of creativity and innovative inventiveness. Remember how brave the founders of this country were? Theirs was a much more dangerous leadership than any we've experienced since. Creating a new country and a new conception of governance and democracy was dangerous indeed. Had they failed, had the American Revolution failed, they would almost certainly have been put to death. Yet what were they thinking about? A new nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Well, they made a few mistakes. It wasn't all men or any women but it was a giant leap in the right direction. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who became bitter opponents and the founders of the first two political parties, both wrote passionately about the importance of public education. There are some knuckleheads back there in Washington who mistakenly suggest the founders didn't include public, public education in the Constitution because they didn't believe in it. That's a misreading of history in my view. Jefferson, the big states' right guy, he wrote, Every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people themselves are the only safe depositories. To render even them safe, their minds must be improved to a certain degree. An amendment to our Constitution must here come in aid of public education. The big states' rights guy, you know, that guy. Can I steal one of those? Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Adams laws wrote this, laws for the liberal education of youth are so extremely wise and useful that to a humane and generous mind, no expense for this purpose should be thought extravagant. Later, these two opponents became friends. Why can't we foster the kind of collaboration that Jefferson and Adam developed across the aisle? And along the way, we need to visualize and create an education system that speaks to children in an authentic and wonderful way by providing coursework that is hands-on, relevant, alive, and inviting. I want to stress that as an educator, policymaker, public policy administrator, as I consider research to be of great port importance. I must say great research, though, in the land of petty, small-minded, short-sighted political figures can be an exercise in futility. I think the fault in California and in America is not a lack of quality research, but the failure to embrace the research and elect officials to do what we know will work. Too often, the policies of our political leaders are quick fix boutique solutions, usually solutions we can do on the cheap, but sometimes there's real money invested in some short-sighted, sexy-sounding palliative that is not steeped in research but makes a fine sound bite. It is the lack of courage, vision, and heart of those who are our policy makers that has fostered education mediocrity in too many places in California. It's important to remember that the budget of a nation, a state, or a school district is like the budget of a family. It is a statement of values. This is important insofar as our state budget was in such deficit and there was a raging debate about how to repair the problem. The state decided to borrow the money from schools and higher education. And that is not what healthy families do. Families keep the cuts as far away from children as possible. 
At least healthy families do, and I think there are a bunch of them in this room. But wait, even more shocking, the Constitution of the State of California actually says education comes first. California Constitution, look it up. Article 16, Section 8, this is a quote. It's under state funding priority. It says this, from all state revenues, there shall first be set aside the monies to be applied by the state for support of the public school system and public institutions of higher education, end quote. It says that in the state constitution that our legislators take an oath to uphold. Most of them don't even know it's there. This is a time and a place, then, for dreaming about education expansion again. We can change the education paradigm, but only with leadership. There is power in that dreaming and doing that I was talking about. When I became superintendent of public instruction, my first major initiative was reduced class size in kindergarten through third grade. I hope some of you benefited from that. But the reality is I also called later that year for a garden in every school. Two governors, one Democrat and one a Republican, pretty much ignored the call. They gave no support. But there were supporters like Alice Waters and the Shafe Penise Foundation, Future Farmers of America, the Center for Eco-Literacy, California Women in Agriculture, Garden Clubs, Farm Bureaus, the California Coalition of Family Farms, and lots of PTAs. Our own UC Davis was a fabulous ally, creating a children's garden and providing a regional center as a resource for children in this area. And they helped me with research that proved I wasn't crazy. One old soul on the State Board of Education said gardens were frivolous and distracted kids from real learning. But I had the research to dispute her false claims. And when I left office, we had gardens in over 3,000 schools, with gardens at the center of our effort to create healthier, more engaged, better motivated, more academically successful children. We can get children to much higher levels of achievement, even as we make education more fun. We know that gardens are living laboratories, so at just the time people across the land are bemoaning the starry state of science education, we have a wonderful key to unlock the imaginations of our children about science. But all subjects can be taught. In the garden, where better to come to understand measurements and mathematical concepts? Add to this the kitchen and many joys of cooking, and now we're really cooking academically and in terms of health. I question whether the best way to improve education is merely to lecture to students, and yet there are some who would take us in that direction, particularly in science. In California, honest to God, there was a serious effort by the State Board of Education to limit a student's hands-on science experimentation to 25 or less of the lessons from their teachers, and to inform children in advance what the outcome of any experiment should be. This is exactly the wrong way to teach science. And leading corporate CEOs and the chancellor of all 10 campuses of the University of California waded in to prevent that. They sent a strongly worded letter that said the state board, board's approach was the wrong way to teach science, and it was quietly dropped. Sadly, the courage to do what is right is in short supply these days. I'm struck that in July of 1862, during the darkest days of the Civil War, President Lincoln had no research to support building a national system of schools of higher education. But he did a courageous thing. He supported and signed the Morrill Act, creating the land-grant college system. Mind you, his predecessor, James Buchanan, had vetoed the bill. He didn't have a civil war draining his resources, but he nonetheless vetoed the bill. The stated intent of the Morrill Act was to assist members of the working and agricultural classes to obtain a liberal practical education. How did Lincoln do? Well, every state in our union has at least one land-grant college. There are a total of 181 such institutions in the country. Millions of students have been educated in these institutions. Lincoln had no research to guide him, but he had vision. You know these land-grant colleges by names like uh, Duke, Cornell, Purdue, a little place called UC Berkeley, a little place called UCLA, a little place called UC Davis. So Lincoln didn't have the research, but he had the courage and the vision and the heart. In the early 1960s, President Kennedy challenged our nation to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Many forget how roundly criticized Kennedy was. It's too expensive, Mr. President. The schedule is too ambitious, complained others. It's too hard, complained still others. President Kennedy replied, 
we go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Tonight, I have been talking about something that is hard, yes, something that is expensive, but something even more important than those giant leaps for mankind made in space. We need to educate our state to take the education of our children to heart and to commit ourselves to dramatically improve education by reinvesting in education from preschool to graduate school. I say it again, it will be hard, but not as hard as founding a new nation or winning a civil war or abolishing slavery or the Marshall Plan or going to the moon. But the state of California needs to wake up and put education and our students first, as I said, from preschool to grad school. I have lived long enough to make this observation. There is nothing wrong with our children and our young adults. I am, however, somewhat worried about some of the grown-ups. Somehow, we lost our way in terms of values, because the California I grew up in had values that put children first. When I arrived at UC Davis in 1965, nine of the 10 campuses of the University of California were built and open. We've opened one measly campus in 50 years. California was fifth in the nation in per pupil spending in K-12. As late as 1985, 15% of the state budget went to higher education. 3% of the state budget went to prisons. Two years ago, we dropped to 50th in per pupil spending. With the restoration of some of the K-12 money stolen, we may climb to something like 35th in per pupil spending. Meanwhile, at one point, Higher education dropped below prisons as a percentage of the state budget. Today, the governor's budget proposes to spend 12.4% of the budget on higher education and 9% on prisons. So prison investments are up threefold as a percentage of the state general fund, while investment in higher education is down, just at a time when education got more important than ever before. My favorite quote may well be Neil Postman, who said, "Children." are a message we send to a time we will never see. What is our message to the future? Perhaps you're thinking, how can we afford to do these things? I say, how can we afford not to? Over the years of visiting schools, and I went to all 58 counties, I had an awakening. At first, it may seem like a semantic distinction. To me, it is much more. To me, it explains the power of a child's dream. When you look in the eyes of a child, we often say we see the face of hope. I now realize after talking with so many children that it's really the face of optimism. There's a difference. We hope with our fingers crossed. Optimism is a hand waving in the back of the classroom. Optimism is running to the library, is trying again and again at the language lab, the computer lab, the basketball hoop, cooking in the kitchen, working in the garden. Optimism is a homeless girl waiting in the tide pools, dreaming of being a marine biologist. I met her at a school for homeless children in San Diego, California years ago. She had such promise and such optimism. I'd like to think she's in this graduating class. America is not just in need of hope. The beautiful possibility is optimism. America is in need of a good case of optimism. And you catch it from children and young people. Martin Seligman, in his brilliant book, Learned Optimism, put it this way. The traditional view of achievement, like the traditional view of depression, needs overhauling. Our workplaces and our schools operate on conventional assumption that success results from a combination of talent and desire. When failure occurs, it is because either talent or desire is missing. But failure can occur when talent and desire are present in abundance, but optimism is missing. He notes that optimists catch fewer infections than pessimists, have better health habits, and live longer. He even notes that self-control predicts academic achievement. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm a believer in children, in education, and in optimism. You are my heroes today. My hope is that what you are doing will spread optimism about education and about the future of our state. Academic achievement is important, but we must support the whole child, thinking about their social and emotional development, as well as the development of our children's bodies and their characters. I thank you for being graduates of the University of California, Davis. And tomorrow or the next day or soon after graduation, I hope you will focus on how we grow this great university and its research and recruit warriors for truth and for the future. Please join our Alumni Association. It's a great way to keep in touch with UC Davis. 
I thank you from my heart for this medal and for the great joy of being here tonight. You really are commencing your careers and continuing education at a time when the children of California and America and the world need you more than ever before to help them to receive what you are celebrating today. So, my wish for you, have a wonderful life and go Ags. Thank you very much.